Welcome to Board Game Breakfast, episode 17. My name is Tom Vassell, and we have lots to talk about today. First of all, we'd like to thank our Kickstarter backer um, for this episode. It's the folks from Board Game Storage. They make colored game baggies. Now, I actually have quite a few of these. I have uh, here, I have yellow and pink and orange and black. I have both, I have the two main sizes, the four by sixes and the three by fives. I also have red, green, blue. I keep all of these stored in my board game drawer. I don't use them for every game, but for games where I have pieces of different colors, I often use them. I think they're a cool alternative. And so you can get these at boardgamestorage.com. Lots of things happened last week. We got out a lot of reviews, another top 10 list, including a review of possibly the worst game of all time, or at least one of the runners up for that one-upmanship. <laughs> I was not expecting the amount of views that that video got, but Many more things are coming this week, but before we get out anywhere else, I think the best place to start with is the news. All right, in the new Z-Man has announced a game, Chimera, which they say is Teach You for three players. Now, I think this will go over really big, considering how popular people Teach You is, and how many times I've heard in green groups or conventions where people say, we need one more for Teach You. Well, now you don't. You can play Chimera. Uh, Red Raven has announced the last word, with, and, and Red Raven games I'm really excited about. Ryan Lauquette does a very great job, and so this one's a worker placement style game. Looking forward to seeing that one. Uh, another game has been announced, Lords of, I think it's Exidit. Um, but what's really interesting about this game is it's made by the same guy who made Seasons, and it's in a set in the same universe as Seasons. Now, some people suspect that this is a uh, reworking of another game. The designer has done Himalaya, but we'll have to wait and see. Stronghold has a game coming called Diamonds from Mike Fitzgerald. So now, let's see, Hearts and Spades people play all the time. North Star last year came out with a game called Clubs. Now we have a game that's Diamonds, so we have all the suits. Although this isn't about the suit of diamonds, it's about collecting diamonds. We'll have to wait and see. And there's cards 1 to 15 of the four standard suits. AEG has picked up another one of the Japanese games that everyone's really happy with these days. Uh, their seventh hero, a 77 card deck where you're trying to get one of several different kinds of heroes. Uh, Upper Deck has announced a new version of Legendary. Uh, but, so Legendary, the Marvel game where you, you're cooperatively working together as heroes to fight villains. This is the exact same game now, but you're going to be villains fighting against the heroes. As far as I can tell, the game is the exact same. It's coming with 500 cards, and you will have different groups of villains that are helping you fight against major heroes and different groups of superheroes to fight against. I'm really curious to see how this one will take off. I, and, and is it possible for these games to be compatible? I mean, could you take villains against other villains or heroes against other heroes? Who knows? Uh, GMT, unfortunately, said that they're going to be canceling their Twilight Struggle electronic version, which is kind of a bummer. It's something I would have liked to play. It's one of the few games I think that would be more fun to play some, maybe sometimes online. Uh, and I guess, before I get all the emails, I know you can play it on Vassal. I don't like the system Vassal, even if it has a great name. Um, Perfeteer Press let me know that they're going to be launching later this year uh, Level 7 Invasion. They did Level 7 Escape, horrible game, Level 7 Omega Protocol, a marvelous game, and then this one looks like a cooperative Risk style game? Who knows? Blue Orange also announced several new games, Brave Rats, uh, Battle Sheep, was it? Uh, a couple games that come out. One was a Doodle Quest, which you, you draw on the board. That looks really fascinating. And the first one I mentioned, Brave Rats, I'll actually be reviewing that this week. That's a reprinting of uh, a Japanese game called R, uh, which I liked quite a bit. Well, I like Brave Rats just as much. Well, it's the same game. So anyway, I'll have that review up tomorrow. Okay, there is not a lot to talk about right now because there's a lot of games that are just out of sight that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, games that were just released uh, last week, the new expansion for Legendary, Paint the Town Red, the Spider-Man expansion, and GMT, a war game called Blood and Roses. Coming up this week, and not guaranteed, but we're pretty sure, the new expansion for Smash Up Double Feature and an expansion for Horde's High Command Elemental Rage. Other games were released that cool stuff or re-released um, a lot of reprints of other games or games were put back in stock. You can check all that at CoolStuff.com. But like I said, we're in March, which is not a high season for new games showing up, but they're coming. They're coming. 
Now, uh, something really interesting that I thought would be fun to, to look at. This is a segment which is very unusual, using board games as art. Take a look. Hi there, my name is Seth Van Orton and I wanted to create a segment about board game art. We recently moved into a new house and we wanted to put up some art, but we noticed there wasn't much board game art that you could purchase, so we looked around to make a few pieces of art. And uh, I'm not a very artsy person, but most of these projects are fairly easy. Usually anyone can do them. Alright, so this first one is some Scrabble art. So, uh, as you notice, just uh, some dictionary pages here. Each of these pieces have magnets glued to the back of them. So you can uh, move them around, spell words. We've got our names on here. We often um, leave notes or messages for each other. It's pretty easy to make, so you start off with some... Uh, sheet, sheet metal, 2x3, that you can find at a local hardware store. Pre-cut, it's pretty easy, pretty cheap. Just make sure that it's magnetic. Some, some metal is not magnetic. Then uh, you'll get a dictionary um, and rip out some pages. Glue it on with some rubber cement. You know, put several layers of dictionary pages overlapping each other. Then you'll spray it with some clear coat satin to make sure the paper lasts longer. Then you can get it mounted uh, for, on a pre-made frame pretty easily at a craft store. They'll probably put foam core behind it for you for free. The magnets you can get at, on Amazon, about 100 of them are pretty cheap. You can get a package of those. Just attach them with some super glue. And uh, the Scrabble board pieces are pretty easy to get. Most of the time you can get an old Scrabble board at a local thrift store. Anyways, this is the project. It's fairly cheap, fairly easy to make. I'll hopefully show you a few other projects we've done uh, in coming episodes. Our question today comes from Mark, who wanted to know, he wants to buy a dungeon crawl and he wants to know what the best dungeon crawl was. Now this might seem like it's top 10 list material, but there's not really that many good dungeon crawls out there. Uh, the one that will come to many people's mind is uh, Wrath of Asharlan or Legends of Drizzt or um, the Castles Ravenloft, which are all the same game and compatible with each other. And I, I, I think it's a great game, obviously it's in my collection here, but it's more of a cooperative game to me rather than feeling a dungeon crawl. It's hard to explain. You have to kind of play it. There's no dungeon master or anything. You just, you're working together, but it's this cooperative game rather than feeling like you're exploring through dungeon and finding things. It's, it's certainly fun though. And I like it a bit. It's, it's, it's kind of just on the cusp of being a dungeon crawl. So I, I have kind of four different levels of dungeon crawls. Um, first of all, if you want something that has nothing to do with dungeon crawls, but some people think it's a great game, that's Kingdom Builder. But if you want something that you know, actually answers the question, um, the lowest level that I have on my shelves is called Super Fantasy. Now this game is harder to get in America from Red Glove Games, but it's, it's starting to come into the stores more, and you should be able to find it more this year. This is a fun, obviously very silly theme, but the, this, this has some really cool mechanisms on how to use action points. I really like it. Um, it's not that complex, pretty easy to get into. Then if you want the full experience, of course, you'll play this one, which I really love, and that's the sense, and this is the second edition version of it with plastic miniatures and everything. It's like Dungeons and Dragons, if Dungeons and Dragons was mostly kick the door down and fight everything. I mean, there's other missions in here besides fighting stuff, but that's basically what it is. It's a tactical dungeon crawl combat game, and it is fantastic. And then this one, which just is coming out now and will be out this year, is Myth. This has a lot of similarities to, to Descent, but a lot of differences too, and it's a much more complex one. So your which one you want to get of these, Super Fantasy, Descent, or Myth, depends on what level complexity. Myth has some pretty high complexity. We're talking war game level complexity, although amazing miniatures may be just as good as the ones from Descent. It's hard to tell. You know, they're, they're both quite good. Um, and so I I like all three of those games. Now, if you want a dungeon crawl that's not fantasy, then you may consider the game I mentioned in my new segment, Level 7 Omega Protocol, which has a very similar feel to uh, dungeon crawl, but it, it's, it's in the future or in some alien, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's really cool. SOS Titanic. A cooperative card solitaire style game for one to five players. The Titanic has hit an iceberg. You are the crew trying to organize the passengers into line and into lifeboats. On your turn, you can set up a passenger rescue, meaning draw one to five cards. 
The rule is upper class and lower class can't mix. If you have a one which is a lifeboat, you can start an order of number loading them into the lifeboat, saving them. If you draw and cannot place a card into the lines, you have failed and have to turn a page of the Titanic booklet, meaning time is running out. The game ends when either the last passenger is saved, hard to do, or the last page of the booklet is turned. Then you add up all the points based on the highest number on each lifeboat. The historical crew would only have scored 19. Can you do better? There are other special action cards you can play, and each crew member has a special power. The artwork is inspiring, and you feel the pressure as you see the ship going down. For me, it shows how a great theme with popular mechanics make a good gateway game. Out of five, we give this game a... Five. Today what I'd like to do, and you can see I've tried to create a little bit of a zen atmosphere here, I've got my little zen garden candle thing going on, because I'm going to look at what many people say is the most zen game of all time, and that's obviously... Takeda. So the first thing you'll see when you open up your box of Takedo is this glorious board. It's beautifully illustrated, carries the theme very, very well. It's got a very minimalist look and feel to it, but that ties in perfectly with the theme of the game, which is a nice leisurely stroll across the old East Road in Japan. The next thing you'll get is a beautifully illustrated rulebook. This rulebook explains the game very nicely with just enough illustration and enough sort of flavor text. It tells you a little bit about Japan, about the inspiration for the game, which is really also very nice. And it's very simple and straightforward to follow and well written. You get five little character meeples in five different colors. And you also get your five little score point markers and your five character sheet color markers, which we'll show you in a bit. Next thing you get are the selection of character sheets. Each of these characters have got different special abilities and starting items. Those little colorful player color markers slot into a little opening in the top left of your score sheet so you know I'm blue and this is my character. You get some punch board tokens which are used as coins or currency in the game. You get loads of decks of cards, each for different uh, events that you're going to encounter along the road, whether it be food or shopping or random encounters or hot springs. And you also get some decks for the special bonus scoring at the end. What's really exciting are these decks. These are the panorama decks. And as they unfold and as you start set collecting, you're going to start revealing this beautiful picture. And obviously the person who does the best will score the most points. And that, guys, is what you get inside Takedo. I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to making a lot more videos for you in the future. <laughs> From the Dice Tower this week, we have more reviews coming. Um, my goal every week is to put out 15 reviews. And if you notice, that never actually happens. When does it always happen? So like last week, I only got out 11 reviews. And I, and I apologize. I want to get them out. But at the same time, we want to make sure we do a good job on each of them. And last week, I got sick for a day, which kind of took me out of uh, rotation for a bit. But I have... 15 ready to go for this week and all different sorts of games. In fact, I, one of the, I'm going to try to take a relook back at a classic game, Puerto Rico. Uh, try to do some of the classic games every once in a while to give you kind of a look back at how they are. But there's some other things that are taking place this week on our channel. First of all, you'll have our regular Dice Tower show, which will be posted this Tuesday, and all our other shows, which you can find at DiceTowerNetwork.com. But then there's a couple big things. First of all, Thursday night... Here, live on this channel, I'm going to be doing a kind of a, a well, a uh, Google chat with uh, Terry from uh, Geek and Sundry. And we're going to be taking a look, me and her, at um, Star Trek Attack Wing. So hopefully you guys can come on and watch that live um, and, and see what we discuss about that. Also... I was not able to go because I have a baby that just was born recently, um, but Eric Summer, my co-host of the Dice Tower Show, and uh, Dan King, Game Boy Geek, you see many of his uh, reviews here, ha are going to Gamma Trade Show in Las Vegas this week. This is a trade show where all the publishers and, and store owners get together and have a great time, and they come in here and they take uh, videos and they show off a lot of the new games. So if the internet connections work, they will be uploading those videos to me, and I will be putting those and editing those and getting those up on the internet. I cannot guarantee that that's going to happen, but we're hoping to have that come out this week. Or if it's not this week, then you'll see some of this stuff next week. We also, thanks to an, uh, a somewhat, I don't know, I don't know how to explain this happening, but at some point in time, it might happen this week or it might happen next week, Sam Healy and I need to get together and play the My Little Pony CCG because people paid money to charity for this to happen. This is not going to become a trend where people pay money and I play games for that. But um, I was planning to play this one anyway. So let's, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Maybe we'll even do that live. And there might even be a live thing on this show this week other than that. But don't count on that. There's a lot of different things swirling around. All right. Enough about this. Let's get to where are we now? Ooh. How to make a game group. Dice Towerers, 
Dice Towerites? Taronians! Oh. Hello there, viewers! I'm Chaz Marler of the Pair of Dice Paradise podcast. I'm very grateful to be invited onto the show. I swear, I'll make you proud. There's a lot of great news and discussion about board games on this show already, so I wanted to do a two-part series about the other ingredient in gaming, the players. Specifically, finding those players. See, recently I'd found myself coming home from work to, inevitably, work on more work. So about six months ago I started a board gaming group in my town. More games, new friends, fewer spreadsheets. But when starting a gaming group, where should one begin? By spreading the word. Now, because I usually end up spending my disposable income on meeples and tattoo removal, I needed to start with the most cost-effective method possible of spreading the word. The simple tear-off flyer. Many places have bulletin boards where you can post your flyers. Grocery stores, libraries, church and college campuses, comic book shops, and of course, game shops. This may sound low-tech, but in my game group, 11% of its three dozen members found it from flyers that I distributed in this way. For a high-tech approach, there's many places online to publicize your game group. Now, I'm not just talking about the social media sites like Facebook, Google+, or Yahoo Groups, but also more targeted efforts like submitting your group's info online to your local newspaper's event calendar, using BoardGameGeek.com's Find Gamer search tool, or becoming a member of Meetup.com. Now lastly, remember that people may not actually come from where you expect. I live in between a big city and a small town. At first, I focused my efforts on the larger city. Bigger population means more gamers, right? Surprisingly, more members have come from the smaller town. Now, once you've found gamers to join your group, you're just going to need to figure out what to do with all these people. And we'll continue there in the next installment. Cooperative games are great for bringing people together on game night, but on a mobile device, they're actually really great for solo play. One of the best cooperative games ever released, Pandemic, also has a really nice iPad version. So let's take a look at this slick port from Z-Man Games. In Pandemic, you are part of a crack team working to treat and cure four deadly diseases infecting the world. A system of compounding infection through deck stacking ensures the tension and challenge is always high. Each choice you make is critical as you balance fighting outbreaks and working towards the cures that will save the world. Released by the digital arm of Z-Man Games, F2Z, the iPad version of Pandemic is an excellent digital implementation. A thorough interactive tutorial and the option to play with tips helps you get rolling while smart interface choices using well-cued trays ensures all the info you need is visible or easily viewable. And a really nice touch that few board games have implemented is that Pandemic plays in both landscape and portrait mode. The game supports two to four players through pass and play, but you can also play solo by simply playing all the roles yourself, which is how I play. Some have complained about the lack of online multiplayer, but the cooperative nature of Pandemic doesn't really lend itself to a great online experience so I think this was a reasonable exclusion. A recent update added some features of the On the Brink expansion as an in-app purchase, generating hope that even more expansion content will be added in the future. As with the table game, the app is challenging to beat and you'll fail as often as you win, especially with four levels of difficulty to choose from. But win or lose, you'll have a lot of fun trying to save the world. So give it a try! <laughs> Last week, I reviewed a game uh, with Sam Healy called Russian Railroads, which I think is a good game and good enough that it actually is on my shelf right here. Okay, And for a game to make my shelf these days, it has to be really good. And I thought the mechanisms in uh, Russian Railroads were fantastic. But I did say in the review pretty strongly so that the theme was almost non-existent. And I got really raked over the coals by several viewers for saying such a thing. And people talked about how when I first got into Euros a decade ago or so, um, and I wasn't nearly as mean on themes as I am these days, and theme isn't that big of a deal, and I need to lay off it, etc. Well, I wanted to talk about that. And I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm never going to apologize for that because... Theme, to me, is important. Now, I know it's not important for everybody. I know theme isn't something that everyone cares about, obviously. Yeah, otherwise, games like Hansa Teutonica would never be designed because no one would buy them because the theme is non-existent. And there are people out there who really like game mechanisms. I also realize that theme alone is usually not enough to carry a game. Although I would argue that theme alone can carry a game, 
like in Tales of Arabian Nights, just like mechanisms alone can carry a game. But I think the greatest games ever are the ones where the mechanisms and the theme come together in loving matrimony and make this fantastic design. And yeah, I'm going to call it games that don't have theme, even if I like them. Because for me, a game is, is an experience. And while it's fun to say, oh, I can do this and that, and I have some favorite games that are a bunch of mechanisms like Dominion. But if you watch my list, my opinion of Dominion is slowly dropping because while I like it, it's great mechanisms to go around and build a deck. I like Thunderstone better because there's this story behind it. Now, a lot of people out there equate this, oh, you like themes, so... There's dungeon crawls and science fiction, you know, you like the geeky stuff. Well, yeah, I do. Uh, I won't argue that I like superheroes and dungeon crawls and, and sci-fi and that cool stuff, but I like all sorts of theme, and if the theme is really strong in a game, I'm not really too upset over what exactly that theme is, unless it's, <coughs> uh, you know, trading in a Mediterranean. But I think theme is great because when I can talk about a game and I can say, yeah, at this one point, I built this structure which let me convert this electricity into this, that's pretty cool. See, I think there's really strong Euro games with really strong themes. Power Grid is a perfect example of that. It's a great Euro game, but it has this super focused theme in it. And when you do it, when you buy a card as a power plant, that makes sense. You're buying that card, which means you need to buy this trash, which you will then convert into energy to power these cities. The theme works along with the game. So I'm not certainly trying to downgrade folks who don't care about theme in their game. Um, if, if, if you don't care about theme in a the game, that's fine. But for me, it's a huge deal when it comes to a game. And it will take a game that I might consider to be perfect down a notch because I wish I could be more involved with the game. So with Brush and Rails, it's a great game and I'm keeping it on my shelf because I love it. It's great ways to get points. But the theme isn't there. And the theme for me also needs to be something that kind of just flows out of the game. I hate when people have to kind of work backflips around to kind of justify the theme. If the theme doesn't work, then just say it doesn't work and move on. Don't try to justify it. Like in Rush Railroads, people say, well, if you look at it this way and this way and this way, the theme makes perfect sense. People say the same thing with DC Deck Builder. Well, you know, when, when you're Batman and you're playing Superman's Heat Vision, what that means is you were able to get a hold of Superman and they, they, they work these backflips. Forget it. The theme doesn't work in both of those games, so let it go. I know. I'm going to get negative comments below this. And, and, I, and I don't mean it as, I, 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 I know that there's this big argument and people say I put too much emphasis on theme, but I'm telling you, theme is still important. And one of the things is, because here at the Dice Tower, one of my goals is to get people to play fun games. And theme is the great hook to do that. When I say, for example, that when we used to play different um, introductory games, and I, for the longest time, Bonanza was one of those games. And I would say, this is a game about planting beans, and people kind of edge back. And I, so many times, I wish that there had been some other theme for that game that might have drawn people in, because that theme kind of just was like, eh, I don't want that. But I love having this huge variety of themes behind me. Because if someone comes to my house and I know they like superheroes, I got some superhero games. If they like the Wild West, I got some games like that. If they look like ancient history, if they like modern business, if they like trading on the Mediterranean, or whatever their, their, their kind of likes go to, I have those themes. And that theme is a hook for them. And I can't tell you how many people I got to take a look at a game because it had a, a theme that was interesting to them. And that's so very important, I think, in a hobby to get people in a game. Now, once the theme draws them in, you need good game mechanisms to back that up. And I am in no way saying that good game mechanisms are not important, because they are. Because I played a lot of games, eh, I might even have a couple this week, where the theme was strong, but the game didn't back that up. And that's not good either. But I am never going to not talk about theme because it is important to me. It's important to my enjoyment of the game. So why wouldn't I mention that in my reviews? I love theme. Make good games with cool themes in them. It doesn't have to be about riding a dragon while fighting robots. Um, but it could be about opening a grocery store and having that theme. Or running a cool restaurant. And, or making a delicious dessert. Hmm, food seems to be kind of high priority here. But there's lots of cool themes out there. Theme is great. Make good games with it. Hi there, welcome back to another edition of Snake's Favorites. I'm Mikhail and today I'll be talking about Cockroach Poker.
Cockroach Poker is a bluffing game. Probably one of the best we have. Probably one of the best in the world. In it, you are handed a hand of cards. There are 64 cards in this box, each representing one of eight different animals. Pretty simple game. On your turn, you hand one of the cards to another player at the table. You tell them what kind of animal it is. For example, this is a spider. Of course, it being a bluffing game, you never actually have to tell the truth. Hand it to a person. Tell them it's a fly. They then have a choice. They can either say, yep, and agree with you, nope, and disagree with you, or take a peek at it and pass the blame along to another player. If they say yep or nope, flip it over and get you in a lie or telling the truth, you've got to take the card and put it face up in front of you. Four animals of the same type means you lose. Everyone else wins the game. You don't want to be the person who loses, generally. Um, great game, pretty easy to learn, huge hit amongst the crowd at Snakes uh, as it takes maybe about 20 or so minutes to learn and it's a lot of fun seeing what type of terrible lies you and your friends are capable of. Um, if you like this game, you might also enjoy the game Skull and Roses. Uh, you might also enjoy the game Masquerade or Coup if you prefer to bluff. Um, as it is though, it's one of the most accessible bluffing games we have and the illustrations are all unique and pretty cute in their own grotesque way. And that's it for this time folks. Don't forget, if you can't, uh, don't have time to watch these, you can download these and listen to them at DiceTowerAudio.com. Uh, I put the audio of the board game Breakfast, some of our top 10 lists, a few videos. As time goes by, we don't put everything there because we don't have room for all the audio at that site. We're not getting the downloads to justify paying the increased cost for that. But some of this stuff is there. Also, you can find out things at DiceTower.com. I would invite you to the Dice Tower convention, but that just sold out. Woohoo! Um, lots of cool things. I have so many games that I need to get played and talked about. It's, it's it, Good things are coming. But happy St. Patrick's Day. Have a great week gaming. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. To find out more about all of our podcasts, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. To see a listing of our videos, head to Dicetower.com. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Cool Stuff Incorporated, where you can buy games for great prices. Cool Stuff in Stock.